yeah, first of all, really appreciate you staving off lunch for another half an hour for me, so I really appreciate that. Um, my name's Alex Jars. I'm Head of Impact and Planning at Clarity, and we're a marketing communications agency that work with technology companies. So I'm here today to talk about convincing the CFO, the effectiveness lessons you need to teach the boardroom. And the reason I chose this subject today is because I think in this room and beyond, we're quite well versed in the value that PR can bring to reputation, to trust, these kind of impact measures that communications really directly owns and contributes towards. However, sometimes we can find ourselves within organizations or with clients who have a really strong and heavy marketing function. And that marketing function is bossing the entire budget and they want to compare apples to apples. So what I wanted to do here is give us as communicators the ammunition to be able to overcome those barriers that will appear. Because that's ultimately what's going to get in the way of us achieving our comms mission. I think the most obvious barrier of all, of course, is budget. It's really easy to see if we're not being funded enough. Um, no less difficult to overcome. That's why I've picked on the CFO in my title as well. But it could be trust, it could be belief, it could be motivation. Any of those barriers that exist within that C-suite can really get in the way of achieving what we want to achieve. So I'm going to break this down into two different areas. The first is the importance of brand building. And the second is why communications. This is all marketing science, marketing effectiveness, but proving the value of communications within that. And now's a really good time to talk about this, because actually a study by the Data and Marketing Association and Salesforce found that the effectiveness of marketing and communications campaigns have decreased by 23%, and that was done earlier this year. And the trouble is when that starts to happen, the, the function starts to look for scapegoats, budgets start to be cut, they get funneled elsewhere. And part of the problem with that, I think, is that communications comes up on the chopping block quite quickly, if lumped in with marketing. We've heard a lot of positive news today, and I I'm in total agreement of communications' new, more esteemed position within the organisation. We have our seat at the table thanks to the communications work we've done during the pandemic. However, the going's going to get really hard beyond this, and we want to retain our seat at the table. So hopefully some of the lessons and statistics I'm going to show you now will help us do that. And so why has this actually started to happen? Well, and I'm quoting from the report, it's due to a bewildering over-reliance on campaign delivery metrics instead of true brand and response measures. In other words, a real focus on those short-term measures and not actually the long-term impact. And I think there's a good reason why that is. The metaphor I like to use is you know, C-suite executives, the CFO, they're often like magpies when it comes to measurement. They're really attracted to those really shiny metrics that you can find that tick up on a real-time dashboard and prove business value. So clicks to website, leads generated, sales generated, and probably most attractive of all is cost per acquisition, which I think is really attractive to a CFO. Cost per acquisition, it typically within a digital marketing sense, is the ability to look at this person clicked my ad over here, then they went away, and then three clicks later, they actually came back and bought. So then you can calculate the cost it took you to acquire that customer based on how much it costs the, the, that ad set which is actually a really narrow-minded and incorrect view of how the buying process works. We're not rational people. I quite like a funnel, actually, but we don't follow a funnel-based process. And there's so many emotional and short-term cues that we use, whether it's buying an ice cream or buying a new CRM, that aren't accounted for in this cost per acquisition model and other performance marketing models. And so to illustrate the problem with focusing on that short term, to put that into perspective, if we're faced with a Google search bar, let's say you type in king size mattress or you type in accountancy software. If I'm selling accountancy software, then I can go into Google Ads platform. I can see that you're one of 750 people who type that into Google every month. And of course, I can then bid to reach you on Google search. I can say, yeah, I want to reach you. And that's a really smart idea to put my hand up and bid in the auction model, because I know I'm reaching a potential buyer. I can make a good sale here. But the trouble is, it's publicly available information, and everyone can see the same thing. Everyone else is putting their hand up in this online auction model, 
And because it's an auction, that price gets higher and higher and higher. So the more short-term focus there is, and with no investment in brand building or very little, if you're funneling it all into the short term, you're just bidding against your competitors up and up and up until it becomes sustainable, unsustainable. It's actually been the downfall of a lot of direct-to-consumer brands, and they put so much money into performance, they hemorrhage so many losses, and then they just bottom out and they fold. So that's one choice. You keep going and you hope the losses stop. The other choice is you get to a point where you plateau. There's only going to be about 750 people a month searching for accountancy software, for example. And once you've optimized your performance marketing to reach those people in the right way, there'll be a point where you can't bid anymore before it, becomes stop before it won't be profitable anymore. So you have to stop, which means you're only going to reach that certain number of people and your growth completely stops. You can't make any more sales because you're only meeting the existing demand. And the reason for that is actually also the remedy later on. So established by the Ehrenberg Bass Institute, they're an academic institution based out in Adelaide. Um, they're really highly respected within the marketing effectiveness world. They established that 95% of buyers are not in market. And that's the case with consumer. It's also been, a, been established by LinkedIn, but that's also the case within B2B as well. So this is across the board. And with performance marketing, of course, you're only reaching those people that are in market and have, and have shown that, and that's 5% of the audience. That's much smaller. So you're ignoring 95% of the audience if you're not doing brand building work. But actually, of those 5%, you're reaching even less of them because there are three different ways that people enter the market. The first are those that are willing to do a lot of research, and they're going to be pretty brand agnostic. They'll probably pick from any brand as long as their research says so. That's who you're reaching with performance marketing, and that's it. The second are those that are going to do some research. They've probably got a short list of brands that they know they're going to buy from, and it's a case of which one, and they're going to whittle it down. And the last are those with little to no research. They want to buy from one brand only. They want a quick decision. They trust that brand. They want to get it done. So performance marketing, you're only reaching that first lot on the left, so even less than 5%. And as I'll come on to in the next slide, we're far more emotional in our decision making, no matter what the product or service might be, than I think some of us give us credit for. But if we're actually investing in brand as well, and being serious about brand building, they'll be more likely to pick you of that, those people you reach with your performance marketing. They'll recognize that performance marketing ad, and they'll be more likely to click it. And there are plenty of studies I could have added even more into here of like click-through up rates in the short term because of, because of brand building. But you'll also get to play with the other two areas as well. You'll be more likely to go on that short list for people who just want to make a relatively quick decision with a bit of research, and you'll be more likely to be the brand that's chosen straight away as well. So you're widening your pool, and what you're doing is you're reaching that 95% and making sure when they enter the market that they think of you. So the way to frame it is that brand building creates future demand. In your performance marketing and sales activation, that's existing demand. Brand building is creating future demand. And there's a quote here, and I've, I've talked a little bit, or I've used some kind of B2B examples. There's an old quote, nobody gets fired for hiring IBM. It might be Salesforce now, you, know, very, you could replace the brand name in there. But I just wanted to make the point that this really does apply to B2B as well. B2B decision making is actually all about mitigating risk and it's much safer for the employee and whoever the decision makers are to pick the well-respected brand because no one's going to get fired there, no one's going to get into trouble. It must have been IBM that dropped the ball on this project. It wasn't you that made the wrong decision. So emotion really does come in to all of these different decision-making processes. And that was proved by one of the most rigorous um, marketing effectiveness studies along in the short of it. That analyzed over a 1,000 marketing case studies in real myopic detail. Um, and one of the things they did is they broke it down by those that had rational messages, those that used both rational and emotional, and the, those that used emotional messages. And you can see on the y-axis what's being measured there is the percent that reported a very large profit growth as a result of that campaign. Rational's at the bottom, because if you're just talking in rational messages, that's when you're reaching those people who are in market. They're the people that really care about the granular detail, the ins and outs of you know, the different features you have, and they're doing a lot of research. 
The emotional is how you reach that broader 95%, those that aren't really thinking about that purchase at the moment, but you tell them how your products or service will make them feel, what problem of theirs they're going to solve. And that's why emotion sits at the top as the most profitable type of campaign you can run, because you're reaching that 95%. I still, <laughs> yeah, sorry, James, go ahead. <laughs> so I just want to play out four scenarios as well. Remember, we're talking to the, C the CFO, we're talking to the C-suite here. The first is you don't invest in your brand. And this is what I talked about before. You reach that plateau of sales. You're not creating any future demand. You're just meeting the existing demand as it, as it is. And so you plateau. You've maximized your performance marketing. You're getting the best out of it. But if you start spending more, you're not profitable anymore. If you bid more and more and more, there's a point where it doesn't become profitable. So we can just not grow. But that's never really a good option for shareholders or investors. So we need something else. The second is a late investment in brand. And that's where, let's say, we talked to the board about the importance of brand building. They listened, but they actually didn't decide to do anything about it. They'll inevitably hit that plateau. Then there'll be this really panicky time where brand building is decided to be invested in once they see that plateau coming. But this stuff takes time. It takes a good sort of six months or more to really come to fruition of heavy investment. So there'll be this flat period whilst that brand building comes into play. And depending on the kind of um, financial events you have going on, whether it's a funding round, earnings call, that could be a really difficult time because you want to demonstrate you have a long-term profitable business. And when you hit that plateau, it's not going to look like that at all. The third is you abandon your investment in brand. So you do it for five, six months. You lose patience and think, I'm really not seeing the effects. But that's the time you've got to stay with it because that's when you'll really start to see that lift. So, but if you cut it, you'll have this misleading period where the effects of your brand building work will continue until it decays and drops off and you go back to that plateau that you were at before. But if you continually invest in brands alongside performance marketing, that's when you get that lovely upward graph that everyone likes to see in every one of their reports. <laughs> so when I talk about that balance, the balance between brand building and performance marketing, there is a really well-established rule around how that should be split. That comes from the long and the short of it, their analysis of over a 1,000 marketing case studies. And they found the perfect split is 60% on brand building, and 40% on performance marketing. So actually, brand slightly edges over performance. And that does change as brands mature, just like the title on the graph says. In the first year, for example, you're expected to go a lot harder in what's called sales activation or performance marketing, 65% you know, and 35% on brand. And as you progress towards being a mature or a leader brand, that's when you need to be investing more and more within it. And what I would say about these things as well is that these are guides based on where you are, and there's also guides based on category as well. What you'll find when you implement this within your own organization is you'll find your own perfect sweet spot. But these are really, really good guides. And you can see how consumer financial services actually is like 80% brand, so you don't get involved in that price war um, with co well, on the comparison site. So it's really interesting to hear from Aviva earlier, actually, and their, their strategy, which very much plays into this. And B2B that I talked about earlier, still at 46% on brand activation, which I think has recently been updated in a study um, by LinkedIn and Ehrenberg Bass up to a kind of 50-50 split now as well. So an awful lot of money needs to be going there. And in a lot of organizations, the split will be so far on sales activation. And that's what we're trying to remedy um, through this analysis. So hopefully after all that, we've really convinced the boards and the CFO why brand building needs to be invested in. So we've talked that marketing language that the CMO and others will be doing, um, and we've got buy-in on brand. What we now need to answer is why communications specifically. And as I said before, we know here the effects of reputation, of trust, those impact measures that we own. But still talking marketing's language is actually hiding in plain sight in a follow-up analysis from the long and the short of it called Media in Focus. So even more case studies, even more analysis. It's incredibly thorough. And they mapped the different channels on this graph. 
So on the x-axis is average number of very large brand effects reported. So in other words, the further along you are to the right, the better that channel is at brand building. And on the y-axis, those reporting very large activation effects. In other words, the higher up you are, the better you are at achieving short-term sales. So it's no surprise to see things like print inserts or email or paid search nice and high up for short-term sales. But if we look at the most effective channels for brand activation, PR is actually second only to sponsorship. And that's within the entire marketing mix, let alone the reputational and trust values that we can bring to an organization, comparing apples to apples with the second best channel for brand building. And also, if you look at how high up things like TV or out of home or cinema advertising, which get an awful lot of money, we're actually more effective overall than all of those. We're slightly higher ups. So we're better at driving short-term sales as well, along with brands. And I think this chart really proves why communications both deserves and should maintain its seat at the table, even in a heavily marketing and advertising dominated organization. So three key lessons to summarize what I've been talking about today. The first, if you only heavily invest in performance marketing, you'll stop growing. The second, the remedy is brand building, creating future demand. And the third is that communications is the second most powerful tactic to build a brand and more effective overall than TV, cinema, and out-of-home advertising, which should really secure us a lot of budget. So if you're facing a board or a CFO who's only thinking about the short term, my piece of advice is tell them to go long. Thank you. So, questions for Alex? <laughs> sure. Thanks, Alex. I think that was was really great. And it's one of those perennial questions I think a lot of us face of how do you take brand measures, which are, as you've said, quite disconnected sometimes from the financial metrics that boards are looking at. I wonder if you have any tips for people as they kind of look at all of this research you've presented, how you actually bring that into the boardroom. Is it something where you take those studies themselves and have a conversation around that? Um, or are you looking to link them more directly? Yes, yeah, so when we have conversations with our clients, and as, as we all know, it's about solving business challenges. We'll, we'll always challenge the brief to try and understand what that is. If we can, we'll also try to understand you know, what else is going on within that marketing mix and try and uncover it. Because I think it's um, the kind of marketing effectiveness stuff that I talked through there is really well known by some and it's an absolute Bible and they achieve great things actually. Um, and there are those that haven't seen it before who are real seasoned marketing experts and still haven't seen it. So it's about probing away with those questions and then bringing those rules in as you go. Sometimes you find yourself um, in when we're talking to clients that they'll want us to communicate in a very rational and functional way. You'll ask about what the US, what makes them stand out, for example. Once I was given a bullet list of 20 different, very specific features that I knew the competitors did half of it because I'd done my research beforehand. And so that part of that education process is, right, we need to take this back to an emotional message and here's why. So it's a hard question to give a definitive answer to, but I think hopefully what I've presented there, it's, it, they're, they're the levers to pull, and it's about yeah, asking the right questions and bringing, bringing the right things in at the right time. Another question? I would have for the way another question for my part. In your chart where you showed the branding importance of the different channels, mm -hmm. I thought that newspapers and TV were way too low in comparison to brand recognition and brand attention. Um, would you go back. You agree? Yeah, I was surprised by, um, I suppose we've got regional newspapers there, haven't we, and national newspapers. So that, that's specifically talking about advertising. And I think what they're talking about there is print advertising as well. So I, I would surmise that is due to the 
declining readership of print. Um, and how, so this is the funny way about the way advertising talk about things. They'll say national newspapers and mean like print advertising, and then PR is its own just thing that does everything. So it's, it's a bit of a funny um, piece, but I, I would say that they're talking about print advertising there, and probably due to the, the reduced circulation of those titles as, as time goes on. Um, my question is, so I love it, um, and you focused on um, those short-term metrics are sometimes what really get us, so have you guys, how do you think about your reporting, because um, obviously you need to do reporting and storytelling to make sure maybe you have some of those short-term that help with how we're maybe doing performance-wise short in, in, in the meantime, but making sure you're also including those long-term um, bigger impact metrics as well. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question, and the answer is the AMIC integrated evaluation framework. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> yeah. The ability to say these are our short-term measures and these are our long-term measures, and making that really, really clear from the outset. Because short-term is incredibly important. You know, we saw 40% of your budget should really be going on that and meeting that existing demand. And so what I wouldn't want people to take away from this is we shouldn't be doing any short-term stuff and performance marketing because it's really, really important. But making that clear from the outset, this is the short-term, this is the long-term. And sometimes when, when we're talking about, you know, measurement in, um, an investment in measurement, you know, that longer-term play involves primary research, usually, to really understand. Um, and so it, it sh gives um, our clients the opportunity to look at that and the, op the option to invest in it or not, we would always recommend that they do, and here's how to do it. But if they don't, then they know that you know, it will have a long-term effect because you know, these rules are well established, but unfortunately we won't be able to measure that. So yes, it's the, it's, it's the framework that comes into play. Another question, yes. Hi Alex, great presentation. Um, have you ever, had that argument with um, a CFO or a marketing director around attribution because I've often found when it comes to attribution that the attribution model is often dictated to by the performance marketers. They've decided that they've got their model and surprise, surprise, it's very, very skewed towards you know paid search, online display, whatever it is. Uh, and when you actually look under the hood, you can see well, you know, brand. Wh where's where's your consideration around brand, and the and where's that branded traffic come from from earned media, and you know, there's lots of um, areas that haven't been considered. Yeah, it takes an awful lot of, it, and it very much depends on the individual that you're dealing with. Sometimes we can be working with a client whose you know marketing and comms function gets taken out and put back in again, and the new CMO can be very performance driven, um, and they can be quite difficult conversations, as you say, when, when you have those, those attribution discussions. And it, unfortunately, it does take an awful lot of trust and also belief in, in what we were talking about there to build that in. Um, yeah, it, it, it's difficult. So it's one of those, because ideally you would be able to set a small but significant enough control group to see the difference between those that are exposed to those ads. Ju I mean, just like Marie Mary Elizabeth showed, actually. Um, that was a really, really good example of doing some primary research around those that were exposed to your earned messages and those that weren't, and then proving, say, the increase in consideration. And then you can do something bigger, where you have bigger control groups, and then you can start to see the difference in click-through rates of those that were served the ads um, who weren't exposed to your messages and those that were over the course of, say, three, six months, depending on what that buying cycle is. So I'd say, yeah, start small with um, a control group of people who've been exposed and try and run some, some small primary research around it and then try and get bigger with, um, with the bigger control groups of um, and measuring that against click-through rates later on. Another tough question probably is uh, if you get to the 95 to 5% chart and the client says, I don't believe it. What do you say on that? There's, there's a lot more detail behind all of that um, that, we, that, that I can go into. Um, I'd really encourage everyone to take a look at the long and the short of it, to take a look at media and focus. The long and the short of it actually costs £95 from the Institute of Practitioners of Advertising. But currently, 
someone's uploaded it to their blog as a free PDF, so you will find it. So okay, we'll share I'll leave it there. Um, but no, there's, there's so what I've tried to do here is give a sort of a quick top line overview. Uh, but but yes, that does happen sometimes. But there there is an awful awful lot more proof within both the methodology um, and additional studies that, that we can bring out. If that doesn't work, then they, they will be blind to it. And sometimes you do have to admit, admit defeat in certain areas. But there, there's an awful lot of proof that uh, a person who has a critical eye uh, would certainly believe it and take it on board. I just saw that move. So yes. I think <laughs> lunch is being served. Thank you, Alex. Um, one last question, or may we wrap it? Yes? Yeah? One more. <laughs> okay, one more. With PR, there is also the performance aspects of it. So if you're earning earn media, you get links, that drives organic visibility. What we found recently, it's my big bugbear, is with affiliate marketing. Uh, when a, when a, a marketer is using affiliate marketing, it's another performance technique, they'll go in and they'll rewrite all those links, dropping affiliate links on them, and then those links no longer follow links or something, whatever percentage it is. I don't know if you've, you've found that as a ever, but it, it, if anyone in the room uh, has seen that and wants to speak to me about it at some point, I need a therapy session. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, he, we, one of the things we do where links are important is we specify the link type. So whether it, it was it was direct to website, whether it was just to a retailer, or whether we earn an affiliate link off the back of it. So that can help us in saying, well, actually, the reason that affiliate links there in the per first place is because of that piece of coverage and allows that attribution. Um, but yes, you need to have that link up, and then also. The, the client to understand that relationship as well to, to be able to prove it, but I, I feel your pain. <laughs> okay, concerning therapy, I think John is in charge. <laughs> and uh, for the rest of uh, you, bon appetit, and thank you, Alex, and enjoy your lunch. Thank you so much, thank you.